All right, we are back from the bench uh, for another episode. This is ep episode three uh, coming at you. And we are going to kick this one off with uh, when was that moment that told you, I want to be a coach? So let, let's, let's kind of go around the horn. Um, Gavin, why don't you kick us off? Yes, for sure. Uh, you know, the, the light bulb went off for me, and this is back 21 years ago when I was a manager uh, slash GA for the University of Hawaii Wahine basketball program. And I got to see the day-to-day -day operations of the all-time winningest coach there, Vince Gu. And the amount of preparation, the amount of detail, um, the game planning, so many things that went in to putting a good product there on the floor. Um, and then also the relationship he had with his coaching staff, the players on the team. It just was something that I fell in love with early on. Uh, and I'm blessed and fortunate to still be here 21 years in the profession. And I've gradually moved up the ladder, so to speak. Um, and a byproduct of that are the relationships, not only with players, former players, alumni, coaches I've gotten to work with, but other coaches like uh, my boys here. So it's just been truly blessed. Uh, I fell in love with it way back then. And, um, you know, I still have that kind of that drive and that passion to continue to do so. For me, uh, Gav, very similar, very sort of uh, in that hustle mode of, of helping uh, around. I was at my alma mater and at the time, uh, the Lavin basketball family had their family camps at our alma, alma mater Pacific Union up in Napa Valley. And Steve Lavin at the time was a assistant at UCLA and they had just come off their national championship year. Uh, Ty said me with the big shot and all that and getting to know their family, uh, his sister uh, and, and her husband, John Moore, who was a coach at Fresno Pacific at the time and just, Sort of there was a lot of connectivity with small school background there for me and just understanding their story and, and seeing Steve and his energy was really inspiring to me. And, uh, and so it was really that family allowing me to be a part of that camp and that setting um, because I had come from such a small school, high school, small school, college experience, and I didn't have that connectivity to anything outside of that. And so seeing that energy and, and them allowing me and welcoming me into that sort of world and that family said, Hey, this is something that you can do. And they really lifted me up and said, you can do this. And so that's really the, the moment where I realized this is something I could, I could do for a long time. And, and, you know, and I've been fortunate, like Gav mentioned, you know, that's really brought us here to today and, and what this, this whole program is about. So that was the moment where it ticked off for me. Tony, what about you? I think, uh, you know, coaching in general, I think I learned when I was young. I, I, I didn't have great coaches throughout my youth experience. So I thought, I think when I was, when I was young, I really loved practice. I loved the idea of practice and playing hard, you know, and, and enjoyed playing. So, uh, you know, being there to help others was all, always a big thing for me early on. Uh, what sport I was going to, uh, you know, coach or any of that kind of thing, I wasn't sure until I got to Tennessee. Uh, as a student and was, you know, got to be a practice player for Pat Summit at Tennessee. And, um, you know, again, I, I kind of got addicted. You know, you go through practice and you're, you have to be the other player, you know, on another team and started watching films, started working in the office, working camps, doing anything I could possibly to do to figure out how to do this job and be effective. Um, and then also just learning from Pat how to, how to build relationships. I mean, people don't, you know, I think they think with Pat, you know, she was tough and the stare and the glare and all those things. And, you know, she was loud and she was forceful and all that. But all those players called her Pat. You know, it wasn't it wasn't coach. It was Pat. I mean, she was their second mom and that's the way it was. So, you know, that was a big inspiration for me to um, develop relationships with players based on that. Um, so she got me a job. 11-year-old 11 11 girls AAU was my first gig coaching uh, girls or women's basketball. And uh, best thing I ever did. And it was the best thing she could have got me involved with. So uh, that's, where, that's where it started. And that's where the, the love kind of built. And uh, again, through the years, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to work with really good people and, and, and meet really good people. And, uh, you know, throughout the good and the bad in 20 years, you, you learn – 
um, to build kind of what your own thoughts and your own uh, feelings on how things, you know, how you want things to go. And I think that's one of the big things is that if you don't learn from every positive and negative experience, then, you know, you're wasting your time. So, you know, I, I really tried to focus in on learning something new and doing every single job I could do uh, to really learn the, the business and the profession and how to build relationships and all of it inside out. So, you know, uh, I really, you know, you, I miss Coach Summit and I really, um, you know, I, I can't thank her enough for all she did to help build my thought and process and philosophies uh, as a coach going forward. How about you, B? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I, I played all sports growing up and, and my dad was my coach uh, for basketball and, and I was this little, uh, you know, five, seven chunky kid, you know, and, and uh, you know, I had to kind of start that conversation with him for, as a player to a coach and, and I didn't know what it meant at the time, you know, but, but just talking with him and, and telling him I don't want to be a forward at five, seven, I, I'd like to be a point guard at five, seven. And, and it just started that transition of thinking about the game a little differently in terms of just the strategies. And we would always go to basketball games and he would, he would ask about certain situations. So that's where it first, I think, fired up in terms of just the strategy piece. But I went to the university of San Diego and I was on a boat during orientation week and I was standing next to Maggie Dixon. Uh, we were both freshmen and uh, you know, just started talking shop with her in terms of, you know, what, what she was looking forward to and whatnot. And uh, later on, a couple weeks later, she was like, hey, we practice against guys. Do you, do you want to be that? And I'm like, wow, like beat up on you all? Sure. Like I'm, I'm, I'm down with that, you know. And so, uh, you know, I went up and, and met uh, Kathy Marpy, who was the head coach there. And, and you know, she kind of talked about, you know, the role and whatnot. And, and that was back when it wasn't cool. Right. Being a practice player wasn't cool because um, just no one did it. No one understood it. And it was just me and this other guy like I was the guard. He was the, the forward. But, you know, over the next three and then four years of, of just being able to go up to the office and, you know, start seeing all the nuances, the day to day, Gavin, that you kind of talked about, like, you know, I was up there and like, what's that? Well, that's film exchange. You know, you got to, you know, all the, the all the VCR decks, you know, and you have to press record on all of them, you know. Um, well, what are you doing? Scouting reports, you know? And so all of a sudden now from what I think, you know, the first conversation with my dad of becoming more of a strategist started turning into, um, you know, maybe this can be a living type of thing. And, and if it wasn't for Kathy Marpy putting me in contact with uh, Melissa Barker at the time, who was a head coach, former, former assistant uh, to hers, um, you know, I probably wouldn't have got that spark because once I was there and working with her and whatnot, I knew it was what I wanted to do. Um, I remember the count uh, to a T. I sent 256 resumes out that summer and, and only got a call back from one, uh, you know. And, and so I think that's when I knew, like, th this is what I want to do, you know, whatever it took. And I remember Kathy Marpy saying, you know, I, I wish I can hire you, um, but, but you're too close to the players right now because you're a student and whatnot. So I need you to go off and, and become a coach. And that one callback was McNeese State. And so ever since, you know, I went out there with Bridge and Martin, I just, it just took off for me, you know. So, so that was my start. You know, obviously it, it probably stemmed from my dad a little bit, but, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that, that after 22 some years, um, you know, I'm kind of walking into the 20, 23rd season, you know, so, um, but, but that's part of it, right? Like, like through the years, uh, you get to coach, you get to mentor or be mentored, and then you meet, meet good people along the way. And, and I think that's what we want to start telling is kind of our story. You know, we, we've met each other a long time ago and, and we are still in the business. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we want to touch on with our, with our guest today, uh, Yvonne Sanchez, who's the assistant coach at Michigan. Uh, she will be on next. So looking forward to it. All right, we are back with uh, Yvonne Sanchez, Chez, Coach Yvonne, Yvonne, Coach Chez, 
Coach Sanchez, what <laughs> names do you have, right? Like, so uh, I guess it depends on, on when people meet you. You know, uh, <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing now? Yes, Dick? yes. You know, I am here in, in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I'm working at the University of Michigan um, as an assistant coach. That's great. That's great. And, uh, you know, we, we've been talking about when was that time that you, you got the juice to coach? Like that, when was that moment? When, what, story, uh, what story can you tell in, in the sense of what got you started in the business? You know, Brian, Brian, you're going to love this story because um, it started in high school. And um, for those of you that don't know, I played for Coach Don Flanagan in high school. And what he would do on Saturday mornings during the season is we'd have our Junior Eagles program, and he'd make all of us coach a team from the feeder program. So my team, I had Jill Shaver, which um, loved Jill Shaver, uh, for, and, and she played for you guys at USD. Um, but uh, Jill was probably in, I don't know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, seventh grade, something like that. And on Saturday mornings, we would have practice and then we'd have our junior Eagles program and he'd have a bracket. He'd have everything. And, you know, coaching those kids was fun. I mean, he did all he, he didn't even, he didn't do anything part of coaching. We all had to do it. So every member on the team had a team. It was a lot of fun. So I think that moment I was probably, I don't know, 16 years old. That's when I knew I wanted to coach. That's great. You know, off camera, we were chat, uh, chatting a little bit. It's like, we dare you or good luck in finding one person to have to, who has anything negative to say about Sanchez. And we're like, <laughs> yeah, no one, right? Like everybody loves you. Um, you've had such a long career. Um, once a head coach and all these type uh, of great destinations and success at your coaching spots. Um, in terms of that longevity, could you speak upon maybe three qualities or characteristics that have helped you and might be able to help a lot of the younger coaches breaking into the profession right now? You know, I mean, everybody talks about paying their dues, but you have to be a grinder. I mean, I started coaching college basketball in, uh, I don't know, I think it was 19, maybe 91. I started coaching high school in 1989. So the biggest thing is, is everybody now looks for, okay, how much am I getting and what are my perks? Well, in 1989 at, the Academy of Our Lady of Peace, I got $750 a year. And I was ecstatic because, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm living in San Diego. I'm making $7 an hour, you know, working at a facility for abused and neglected children. Um, and, you know, I get a coach for $750 a year. And I, I was absolutely ecstatic. And uh, that was a lot of fun. I get a college job for $16,000 a year at New Mexico State. I was ecstatic. I'm in, I, you know, I'm back home a little bit, three hours away from Albuquerque, and I'm in college. And, uh, you know, you don't think about that stuff now because it's how much do I get? Do I get a car? What are my bonuses? And it's just, um, you know, it's just a different world. It really is. And I know I can't say, oh, back in my day or whatever. I know it's, it's, it's the world we live in now. But when you talk about what we've done and all of you guys I'm looking at because I know all of you guys have done this. As an assistant coach, we did laundry. As an assistant coach, um, we did film exchange. With, we, we set up two VCA, VCR um, recorders. Exact, and then when you went three to one, you were so happy because you know that you got more out. And you know, times you didn't have audio, but you had video. There's times you didn't have video, but you had audio. Um, and then you were FedEx, and you, you knew your FedEx number by heart. People don't even know their own phone numbers by heart but you knew that FedEx number by heart and you knew what hoop one video was. Cause when you got to the NCAA tournament, you got those hoop games on an airplane. And I remember coach Flanning going, what hoop one video? I go, don't worry. I'm just getting game film. You're good. And, um, you know, but we've all done that stuff. We've all, and kids today don't even know that. And, and when you're an assistant coach, especially at a power five school, you're like, yeah, our manager does that or our Dobo does that or our, you know, player personnel, go, go figure does that. You know what, who that was, that was all of us. We were the secretary. We sent out mailings. We, you know, email wasn't even invented then. 
And so it was, it's just, it's good and refreshing to talk stories about people who have done all that stuff where people today have no idea. I love what you're saying there, Yvonne. That's so clutch. That's the second VCR reference we've had on the show today, by the way, which is, which is brilliant. So um, that, that's a perfect segue. Talk about, we, we have, and, and we shared a little bit before you came on, that we see in, in some of the new, young, maybe sort of like we went back in time when we were first getting in, we see like we've each had maybe in the last few year, weeks or so a young person going, well, should I take a dobo job at a power five to have that experience or should I go and be a, be a high school coach or a JC coach? What advice would you give in that situation in maybe context of what you're saying? But what we, what we are feeling is that maybe they're more open to that opportunity to do all those things that, that you just mentioned. Maybe just talk about encouraging in that way or perspective on, on if they were, had those two different opportunities to, to explore. Right. Every young person wants to come in and be the coach. Oh, I got X and O stuff. I have ideas. I use my out of bounds play. And in reality, that's not the situation. I think when you are applying for jobs, you better be able to take anything. And it doesn't just have to be D1. I mean, D2, D3. Um, it's interesting. There was a school um, that had a D2 opening. You know, and I was talking to the AD, not so much for the opening, but just he was trying to get my ideas about a list and who to hire. And I said, you know, the hard part with that is if you're just a D1 coach, but you want to be a head coach, so you're an assistant, not everybody know how, knows how the scholarship works. You know, D2 programs are much different in how you dole out scholarships and how you um, are able to say, hey, I'll give you this amount, but you could still get this from this, this lottery scholarship or this, you know, different aspect. And my advice to people is, is you've got to learn everything because the well runs dry on who you know at times. So yeah, you can know and you can have a list of all these people. And it's funny, the saying the last five years is everybody's got a guy. Oh, that's my guy, that's my guy. But when it comes out to it, you don't have a guy. You know, I mean, you, you've got to be real good with your circle of people. And I am very fortunate because my circle of people hasn't changed in 30 years. It really hasn't. And you're looking at four of them right now. And I have a few others that I truly, truly, truly trust. Um, but you really have to engage in everything. Okay, well, if I do this, and when you're, you're getting an opportunity to interview for a job, you better have a plan. You better say, here's what I can bring to you. You know what, if it's a, an assistant coach, it's gotta be players. It's gotta be relationships. It's gotta be, you know, I can deliver A, B, C, and D. And it, sometimes it looks different from one aspect to another. Um, if you're going to be a dobo, how are you going to organize the head coach? How are you going to, if you're a player personnel, how do you know, how well do you know academics? How well do you know, you know, different aspects that I can take the plate off a head coach? So, you know, every head coach is different in how they want things. Um, you know, I've had different experiences with the people that I've worked for, um, you know, in, uh, John Sutherland and Mike Peterson and Barb Smith and oh, Don Flanagan, um, who is just a different anomaly with me because, you know, we have a different, we had a different bond than I did with all the others, you know, and now with Kim Arico. So you better know, you know, what you can bring to the table and, and uh, you can have a guy and that guy could be, you know, in, but if you can't bring anything, your guy's not going to be your guy anymore. So um, there are different aspects. So don't just bring in, you know, because I've coached high school, I can bring you an out of bounds play. I mean, a lot of head coaches don't want the basketball aspect of it. They want other stuff. What's up, Yvonne? How you doing? Tony, what's up? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to kind of expand on what you were just talking about. Like it's the difference between knowing people and, and I guess, knowing who they are and, and being able to pick up the phone versus having a right. real relationship with them. Yeah. And the, if you can maybe talk about the difference of the two things, as well as how, how both of those types of relationships right. have helped you through your career building to becoming a head coach. 
You know, I think when we first started or when I first started, you know, it was always loyalty for me. So I started at OLP and I was very loyal to Sister Dolores. And she's the one that hired me at OLP. And to this day, I still keep in touch with her. Um, you know, she's since retired and, and uh, is doing different things with the Archdiocese. But I, I mean, that was my first, first coaching job, you know, with being paid and everything. And I still am extremely loyal to her. And, uh, you know, there's nothing in the world I wouldn't do for her. You know, when I got to New Mexico State, it's, it's really real, you know, with, with Mike Peterson and with, um, you know, with, with the university. You know, you're not only loyal to the people, but you're loyal to the place that you work for. And, you know, you have to be. If there's things that are going on that you don't agree with, then it's your position to leave. You know, you, you don't, it's not up to you to say, oh, I don't like this and I'm going to badmouth everybody. No, you know what? You can get up and walk away. And I know it's not so easy for people, but it is better in the long run to do that and be this loyal. You know, New Mexico State is a place that I, I will always be loyal to. Um, Mario Mocha, who's the athletic director there, I mean, you know, we'll speak every once in a while or I'll send them a text or, um, you know, I mean, I follow what they do still over there. And I, I, I still have a lot of um, friends over there and I still have a lot of admiration for what that program does for very little. San Diego State, I was only there really nine months. And I would have probably been there longer had New Mexico not opened up. But I appreciate the things that Barb Smith did for me. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount from Barb Smith, you know, even though it was a short period of time. And um, I'm still very loyal to San Diego State and follow them and, and want them to do well. And obviously, New Mexico is a different entity. It's hometown. You know, if you think about the places, I was at OLP for four years, New Mexico State for six. I mean, I know San Diego State was the anomaly. New Mexico for 16 years. And there's, um, there's a different quality there, but you know, coach Flanagan still coach Flanagan and he did things his own way. And, you know, people have to understand like, um, for us, it was getting him players. I mean, he was always the high school mentality. Hey, you guys are out recruiting. Fine. I got practice on my own. It's not a big deal. I mean, he knew how to do everything. He swept the gym. Like our managers didn't sweep the gym. Coach Flanagan, you saw him before practice. He was sweeping the darn gym. You know, he had both sunglasses. He had his sunglass and his eyeglasses around his neck. And I thought at times he was going to choke himself just trying to grab one of them, you know, so he could see. And, I mean, the guy could still shoot. He could still, but, you know, it, it was, you have to get the quirks of different people. And, and uh, you know, I mean, it, it goes without saying how much I learned from him, you know, just in the high school realm and, and what he did for me. Um, you know, during those years, I mean, we lost one game. We were 74 and one. It was 74 in a row and one. I still remember the game we lost. You know, I could tell you exactly what happened and how bad I played. Um, and, you know, going through what he did at New Mexico, you talk about a program that averaged four season ticket holders. Uh, they were four season ticket holders and they averaged four wins a game before he took it over. And so you think, I, I still have not seen a turnaround um, in any level than what he did there. And, you know, a pack the pit, we had 18,000. Um, you know, we were hosting the first and second round of the NCAA tournament, and it was sold out at 16,000 with the media. So uh, he made it one of the most feared places to play. I still tell people this, even though there's a new coaching regime and it, it goes through, he still built that program. You know, if you want to talk about people rebuilding teams, sometimes you have to do that. But, you know, if anybody wants to go back to rebuilding New Mexico, that's what, you know, Coach Flanagan did there. And, you know, I'm able to work for, for programs and places that people um, have been very successful at. Well, I, I, uh, when I was at Loyola Marymount, we, we played you all. Uh, in front of it, it felt like 50,000 uh, at the pit. And, and we were like, <laughs> how are we going to get our kids to play not only hard, but like get through because, you know, the, you got the painting on the wall, like yeah. how many feet above sea level, right? And we're, we were coming from LA, yeah. so you know what sea level is. Um, so, you know, Julie Wilhoy, <laughs> and we're like, let's buy gum, you know, like anything to just distract them on, on, uh, you know, <laughs> keeping their endurance up. But, yeah. you know, talk to us a little bit about like, um, 
I'm always fascinated with, with, you know, obviously longevity and whatnot, but like, tell us a story about recruiting. Like, like, like what, give us a, a recruiting trip that either went off the wall or, or like, like, like what was fun about it or, or just tell us something about recruiting that like you literally can't get out of your mind. You know, the fun, the fun part, I can, I have a few stories anyway. And, and again, the fun part with coach Flanagan was he didn't fly. So he would drive almost everywhere. So when Oregon city would start, he would start driving about three days before Oregon city started. He had his fishing pole and his waders. He had his routine. So he'd stop in his, in the specific fishing places down the road and he would, you know, fish along the way. It was, he had a barbless hook, so it was catch and release. He'd always send back, when he learned how to use his phone, he'd always send back pictures of the fish he caught. So, you know, that little flip phone he had was, was outstanding. And he, then when he learned how to use the, the photo option, we were like, Dave and I were like dying. And so he would go up. So then I'd meet him in Oregon City, and we'd go down the road. And then so he would go to Seattle after that. So I remember we had to put some stuff in his trunk. And he opened up the trunk and it was full of his fishing gear. And he goes, oh, I don't have room in there. And I'm like, cool. He goes, I got to send that back before I start going somewhere else. And I'm like, it was his boots, his waders, his pole. And he had everything in there. Surprised he didn't have a fish in there. And I'm like, oh, God, there is no other person on the planet, any other coach that I, I could tell this story because it was just funny. Um, but, uh, you know, he would – he would have all kinds of, of stuff. Um, there was times during home visits that we'd go in a home and, and he was starving. And when Coach Flanagan got hungry, you, you fed him. He ate. Like, we're like, okay, let's go. And he liked to go to a restaurant and sit down. He wasn't a fast food guy. So, you know, I said, well, Coach, I think they're going to feed us. He goes, that's okay. I'm starving. So we go and we eat. And then we go to this place and they made us like a three-course meal. It was like everything. So I see him shoving food down his throat. I'm trying to, you know, I didn't eat as much, but by the time we left that house, I think he might've got sick. He was so full, but he ate everything. And it was just like, and I think, I mean, we got the kid, so it, it was, it was well worth it. But, um, you know, he would just, um, he was very unique and, and which made it really well. I mean, he related to a lot of families just because of, the amount of stories that he could tell in a home. And, um, you know, I mean, you talk about the head coaches that you work for, like, you know, he hitchhiked from um, Connecticut to Fort Lewis so he could get in go and go to school at Fort Lewis college. And, you know, he'd have his underwear on his head and he'd sleep under a bridge and, you know, a semi truck driver picked him up and was going the wrong way. So he had to stop him and he hitchhiked the rest of the way. It was, he had some pretty good stories, but I'm like, that's our head coach, you know, and he's telling this and, and some, some families were kind of taken back and others were just like, this is, this is great, you know, and, and, uh, you know, it was just, it was just pretty funny. But hey, everybody, it's Jesse from the bench combos. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks so much for watching and listening. We appreciate you so much. If you haven't done so already, please hit the old subscribe button right there and we'll catch you next time from the bed. Great, getting to reminisce and kind of even uh, have pictures of what, oh. you know, back when, when I first met you, I still remember Dahul, the assistant coach at Hawaii. Oh, geez, yes. you. Um, you know, and it's just great to kind of reminisce about a lot of these things. But, you know, the longer we all get to stay in the game and do the yeah. things that we love, obviously there's, change that occurs i mean yeah. we used to have to fax recruits <laughs> now we just get on a social media platform and right. boom done um you know obviously snail mail is still relevant um yeah. film exchange we talked about a little earlier yeah. but you have to only pick four games in which you could request and now every yeah. game is right at your fingertips um so you know along that with change would there be anything that you right now would be able or would want to kind of advise your younger self uh, breaking into this profession? Um, and then 
after that, I would like you to kind of touch on how the current climate that we're in with COVID-19, you know, that for the most part, taking away our summer access. Yeah. Well, I remember when summer access wasn't relevant, like everybody no. had to go out and do their own thing. So yeah. when we get beyond this, I have a feeling we're all going to be okay. Yeah. Um, I know it's a little two part question, but if you could touch on the advice you'd give to your younger self and then on the other end of this COVID-19 situation, kind of yeah. put everybody's anxiety at ease. Here, here's, you know, right before I answer the first question, you might have to remind me again, just going back to film exchange, do you, everybody remember like when you had all your inner circle friends and then they'd call you and say, hey, School X didn't give me the film on this. So then there was the super secret list and you didn't, you banned that school and you're like, sorry, I can't have the film. Sorry, I can't do that. And it was all based on your friends. And it was, it, I mean, I remember one coach in particular and I won't mention her name, but she had the ultimate super secret list. And it was like, no, no, you're not giving them film. This is why on March 4th to, you know, they didn't give us this and I'm not giving anything else. So I, that just to reminisce. Um, you know, the biggest thing in today, in the day and age, is you've got to learn everything. I think, you know, the most important thing, aside from taking stuff off your head coach's plate, um, is understanding technology. Understand breaking film down. You know, if you're player personnel, if you're any of those film, um, you know, the, the film coordinator, or whatever you call that person now, you really have to understand technology. You know, right now what's relevant is graphics. You know, if you can learn how to do graphics, if you can learn how to do um, film breakdowns, um, you know, individualized plans, um, you know, different recruiting technology, that's what everybody's looking for. What is relevant with kids? I still think mail is relevant in certain terms because I still think kids like to open up mail and get notes, but I do think you have to send that kind of early too in some form and then they get you know the hard copy later uh, or whatever that may be it's an instant gratification and I think you really have to um, know the climate and you really have to like okay what can I bring that no one has seen before because that's the hardest part I mean the graphics are coming off the chain now everything you're seeing on Instagram on you know on um uh, Twitter and then now TikTok's the new face. So I must have I have to come up with a dance at some point or another and you know, wait for it. It might come soon. Um, but uh that is the stuff that, you know, if you're the younger self and you're starting to come out, you better start learning these new stuff because um the other stuff is just pretty irrelevant right now. So that's one of them. Um Man, see, now I've already seen, when you get older, I've already forgot the second question. What was the second one? The second one was give people at their ease, like put them at ease in oh, like we're yeah. going kind of moving forward with the climate that we're in, so. You know, um, it, 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 this is a funny story. And, and so when I was coaching boys with my brother, there was a volunteer assistant we have, Jim Halston, who played for John Wooden from 1956 to 58 because he had to play JV his freshman year. So Jim is awesome, and he, he helps my brother coach at El Dorado. And, and uh, every, when I was there the two years, I just wanted wooden stories. So, like, we'd get to another drill, and my brother's like, come on. I'm like, oh, I was hearing a wooden story. But, you know, I called him up the other day just to make sure he's doing okay. He's a little bit older, and just, you know, he was in a um, kind of an independent living home for him. And he, I go, Jim, can you ever remember anything like this? He goes, well, when I was a kid, we had polio. <laughs> and I just, you know, we both kind of laughed about that because, like, as a kid, he still remembers that. And, and, and he said, you know what? We had to live through that, and everything was okay. Um, this is, you know, with the same pandemic, every, we're going to be okay. But you know what? There's going to be people we know that are going to get it. Um, unfortunately we hear the stories of the people that have succumbed to it and you know, that's the unfortunate part and it's really, really taken everybody back. So as much as we want sports back right now, there's a bigger picture and what the governors are doing are the right thing. I realize that the unemployment rate nationally is out the roof, but we really have to be careful with what goes on. 
Um, you know, and sports has, be, has taken a back seat. I'm not sure what's going to happen in June or July. Um, you know, it, it, nobody really knows. I'm hoping that each month we get a semblance. But, you know, with universities that we're working with across the country, there's different plans. Some are just doing online courses for summer and spring. Um, some are talking about that for the fall. Um, you know, we have to hang in there and see what the new normal is going to be because when everything comes back, it's going to be different. Nothing is going to be the same when we come back and we all have to adapt. Um, I, I like the part of, I mean, we have to all band together. You know, there, there's not going to be the have or have nots anymore. Well, actually I read two articles. There is there either is not going to be the have or have nots or the power fives are just going to break away. And who knows what's going to happen with that, with the money situation. Um, I like the fact that maybe we can all band together and, 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 you know, have a sense of parity with everything, especially with the money that's being doled out, you know, obviously with the football money. Um, there are schools that don't rely on football money, that don't even have football, that will probably be okay. You know, and some of the, I, I think of the West Coast Conference and, you know, the, the, that, those, those schools. Um, I think of, you know, the ones that are kind of in, repeat, in between, the Conference USA or the um, Mountain West, which relies heavily on football money and going to play places that get a million, a million five to go play at a Power Five school. You know, um, they might be in a little bit of trouble early. You know, you look at the scholarship situation. I mean, I thought about this. You watch the WNBA draft, and a kid like Kennedy Carter goes out early. Well, there's a, not a WNBA season because she get to go back to A&M. I don't know. And I don't know if anybody's even thought about that or if it's a, a strict no. Um, but, you know, you think about the people in the transfer portal right now, there's not enough scholarships for. And then it's affecting the 21 class. So are people starting to now go in the 21s? Well, I got to start looking at what my options are because I don't want to lose a scholarship to, to school A, B, or C because they're going to take a transfer. You know, the known to the unknown. And, you know, does it go back to old school? I mean, maybe not a lot of people are looking to transfer anymore because the devil what you know is better than the devil that you don't know. And, you know, I might not, I know what I got here even though I'm not happy. Um, but I might not have something somewhere else. So I think, you know, if you're talking about a climate, people have to be real careful on the decisions they make, um, and especially the recruiting lines. And, you know, I think, you know, if we're at school, whatever, you know, it's the same thing holds true. I think administrators and athletic directors are really, really, um, and you guys have heard at your universities, but I mean, there's, there's going to be a significant change and I'm always the ultimate optimist. So I think it's for the better, whatever can happen. But, you know, at the same time, the new normal is not going to be where we left off. Such, such great points. And you dropped so many, so many nuggets that we could sort of drill down and, and we'll have to have you back on. We'll drill down into some more of these things. I want to segue a little bit uh, and sort of tie in, you know, Gavin talked about, uh, you know, how we used to summer. We, we didn't have contact yeah. with, with our current roster, uh, you know, right. and, and in Division Two, obviously, we don't have that. And just so maybe segue that idea into a little bit of some of the conversation and maybe, you know, one or two things that from your perspective are important, right. regardless of which direction we go, whether whether we have contact this summer or or those of us that don't, but what two things maybe that stand out that in your experience tell you these are two things that we've got to do with our current players, you know, say in the short term, the next, yeah. you know, month to three months, whatever that window is going to look like. But what is, what is that? What are one or two things that you just know that experience tells you are going to be important? You know, you still have to engage with your players and it doesn't always have to be a basketball conversation. Um, hey, how's your family? Uh, you know, I know mental health is a big piece across the country. Some kids, I mean, might not deal with it the same as others. And we think, you know, again, they're athletes and they're mentally tough and 
whatever. But we've got to get a psyche of our team, of our players, making sure that they're doing okay. Um, some can get stir crazy. You know, some might find another hobby. I know that they're still engaged in basketball, maybe not at the same level that we would like them to be. Um, but at the same time, you've got to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, because that's first and foremost. And when you know that, then, you know, you, you stay engaged with, you know, how can we help you through this time? I mean, you know, it's a good time to sit and listen instead of doing all the talking. Um, I know with our kids and just people that I've talked to, they want to get out and just shoot the basketball. I mean, they want to get to a park. They want to get to a gym, even if it's by themselves. Some have access to that. Others don't. Um, but if they can, you know, stay engaged in, you know, the climate and, and in the team, I know our kids are having conversations with each other. That's a great way. You know, don't, you know, no one left behind, you know, make sure that, that, uh, they're doing that now. And, and, you know, as coaches, I mean, you know, I think we've done a really good job of staying engaged with our players and giving them updates on what's going on. Um, you know, what can possibly happen? And, you know, you don't want to scare anybody, but you, no one does know what's going on. This is kind of the one time you just don't know. You know, when 9-11 came about, um, you know, there was going to be a stoppage for a certain period of time, especially in, in one area. Um, but you knew things were going to move on and people were going to have to heal. And sports did that with, you know, baseball and football and, and whatever else it was. Um, you know, this is just really, really different. And the unknown scares a lot of people. And you have to make sure that, you know, we, we assure people it's going to be okay. And, and it truly is going to be okay. And we have to understand that. But, you know, at the same time, we have to get a, a clear um, picture of what the new normal is going to be so we can prepare our kids for it. We can prepare the future for it. And even the coaches. I mean, this is new to everybody. I uh, was thinking about your TikTok dance that you were talking about. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to recall the last time I saw you dance. It might have been St. Louis. Um, Could have been. You know, and uh, which was awesome. By the way, if anybody, you know, is watching, you know, that TikTok is about to be special. special. I, yeah, it, it might be from Elaine. It might be like Elaine from Seinfeld. It, it may have to be <laughs> one of those. But uh you know, those WNBA, those WNBA parties were always fun to go to. Absolutely, absolutely. I guess uh, what i striking about your conversation about Coach Flanagan and just um, the, the recruiting stories, I guess, which was big, was, was the genuineness of it and, and him. Yeah. And I guess if you could kind of comment on what you feel like in recruiting now, how much, not necessarily just you, but just things that you hear from other places – how much of the communication is genuine and how much of it is sales and what you think, which one leads to better retention yeah. uh, as we talk about the transfer portal and, and what other pieces of that can, can help you retain uh, student athletes without them moving, moving on. Yeah. I think just think in general, you have to really get a feel with the kids that you're recruiting. You know, you've got to get, um, I, you've got to get information you know, um, you know, who's their significant people around them? Who's their circle? Um, what do they enjoy? Is it just a basketball piece? Is it, you know, I mean, kids have a lot of different things, especially on social media. Um, you know, you can learn a lot from social media with, with certain kids and what they like and don't like, um, you know, getting into, you know, their high school coach, their club coach, whatever that might be. Um, but I think, there's still a genuineness and, and, and I think it comes from, you know, where you are and where you work, you have to believe in the places that you are, you know, and that's another thing with younger coaches, you can sell, you can sell a lot of things, but people know when, you know, you're talking, um, when you're not genuine in selling the place or the people that you work for and work with. Um, and, and if you're one of those people that are recruiting or are working at a place one foot out the door, what's my next job? What's my next job? I think that's really, really evident. Um, 
you know, you have to, and, and you know what, you're not going to get everybody you recruit. You're not going to, you know, but, but I think you can reach everybody you recruit. You really can. And I do think um, having conversations with parents, having conversations with, um, you know, kids, with club coaches, with, you know, significant people, um, knowing different things about them that, you know, maybe doesn't show up in, you know, the other aspects. Um, you know, that's, that's really important. I mean, you know, there, there's just like little pieces that you can get if you dive deeper in. And um, I just, I really think people know when you're using a sales pitch as to when people know that you really care about them and you're going to care about them for an extended period of time, not just for four years, um, but for a lifetime. I mean, again, we've all talked and how many kids do we still keep in touch with that we didn't get? I mean, and that we're helping still to this day. And this is what this is profession's all about. And I know we didn't dive much into it, but it's not for us four and us five actually with B-Row because, you know, he probably has to do dad duties right now. But for all of us, it's about helping others. It hasn't just been about who plays for you and I'm just going to take care of the kids that played for me. I mean, how many times have we answered a phone call with kids that didn't play for us? But you're like, yeah, what do you need? And what do you need me to do for you? Because in the end, that's how you help the profession. And that's how you make it better. And um, I, I don't think that a lot of people think of it that way. I really don't. And I think even more so now than ever. I think when I first got into the business, People had a genuine passion for basketball because you didn't make a lot of money and there wasn't a lot of perks. You just wanted to be around the game. I mean, when college finished, I mean, we played every day. We went down to Balboa Park. If you guys know San Diego, we played down in South Mission, you know, outdoors. We went to USD and played Monday, Wednesday and Friday because I worked swing shift when I was a high school coach. So I either worked swing shift or graveyard. And I didn't care how much I slept. We went and played pickup and God forbid you lost because you were like, dang it, then you won't get on for an hour or two. And sometimes you didn't get on again. So you just sat and watched. Um, you know, Brian talks about your mentors. Kathy Marpy is one that I will mention as a big time mentor to me. Cassie Macias, my old college coach, who I still keep in touch with today. Um, you know, Kathy, I would go to the gym and watch practice during my, my college or uh, coaching high school and she would open up the gym on Saturdays and she would have her players. It would be all of us. And we'd play some big time pickup basketball. I used to work Long Beach state camp and Joan and Michael Abraham would, and, and Glenn McDonald. Um, Glenn McDonald's a great trivia question. You know, who made the winning shot in the triple overtime between the Boston Celtics and the Phoenix Suns with Paul Westfall, Glenn McDonald people, great trivia question. But you know, and, and I, I remember taking Michael McDonald, his son, to Magic Mountain when he was, I think, 10 years old. And Michael was a big time player for Stanford and him and his wife are doing really well in Boston. I mean, again, it's the relationships. We play pickup basketball over there. I mean, Long Beach State was going to the Final Four. So do you not think like those pickup games, I was working Blue Star West for Mike Flynn. You think those pickup games, I mean, they were just like unbelievable pickup games that you just played till midnight and then you'd go out for a little bit and then you'd have to be up by I don't know 637 and you'd be back working Blue Star or Long Beach State camps so those are the those are the things I remember the best you know I we didn't get paid a whole lot I remember taking vacation from my job you know so I got paid even less but that's what you wanted to do I think I think people in this day and age still have a passion for the game but it's not I don't know if it's as much as we had because I don't know if people will I'm not sure if, if the new ones coming in and the young ones coming in if you can tell them you know what you're going to get paid 10 grand you're probably going to work I don't know 12 hours a day and you might get an assistant coach's spot I, I'm not sure how many people would take that in this day and age I really don't so you know for all of us we're going to stay in it until we no longer have that passion. And I don't think that'll ever come because if it's not the college game 
you know, I'll go, I mean, and I think all of us are the same way. I'll go teach a kid in a park. I'll go open up a gym. I'll, you know, I'll do whatever it takes. And um, I just want people to succeed. And, you know, I mean, I've coached on both sides. I've coached on the guy side. I've coached on the girl side. And, you know, it's fun when the people that you're associated with are successful. It really is. That's why you do it. I, I just want to share, one of you guys can ask a last question, but um, speaking about that and, you know, the character, uh, Sanchez, that you have and the, you know, the genuine feel you have for relationships. I still remember uh, I'm an assistant coach at, you know, Idaho. I go to Augusta, Georgia for the first time um, because obviously at Idaho, there's no need to go to <laughs> Nike Nationals because we ain't getting a kid from there. But we just so happen to be you know, recruiting the 12th player on a team out of California. So, you know, we head out there. Sanchez sees me. We have a relationship. We're talking. You know, she throws out an invitation for me to join her and a bunch of her friends for pizza. And I would have been probably at the bar ordering takeout, going back up to my room. But just something like that uh, speaks volume of just your heart and your compassion. And I am so happy that you are one of my true friends in this industry um, so thank you very much. Little gestures like that, man, go a long way. Um, I look to pay that back and any chance I get. I mean, here you are a head coach at New Mexico and I'm, you know, an assistant from Idaho. You don't need anything from me. Um, I can't offer anything to you, but here you are looking out for me uh, while we're out recruiting. And uh, that's never fallen uh, out of my memory. And um, just thank you for that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse or Tony. Um, but Sanchez, thank you very much, man. It's awesome. Hey, you know what? I probably thought down the road that I might be invited to a podcast at some point or another. So <laughs> let me invite this guy to pizza. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I, I want to echo Gavin. And I think, you know, you, you've always done this. And obviously we had uh, some other friends that are kind of in the circle that uh, have always been kind of kind of there for us. So when you said you had the uh, super secret list, I know exactly who you're talking about that uh, had the ultimate super secret list. Yes. But um, I think that's the fun part about doing this. I know, you know, through the years, it's been great with these guys. Um, but, you know, going through, uh, you know, the years with you. And I think, you know, we played – when I was at Northern Arizona, we played down there to, and, yeah. and Jess to talk to your – and Gavin and Beef's point about playing in the pit. You guys were good, like, too. You, we, yeah. we took everything we had to beat you guys that year. And we had like this 90 year old lady with like blue hair was like screaming at me from like a foot away from the bench. And I'm thinking to myself, God, I wish that was my grandmother. You know, I was like, this is phenomenal. You know, she's yeah. just crushing me right now. It's phenomenal. So, but uh, those were definitely uh, great days and, and we definitely do appreciate you coming on and, uh, and sh sharing your wisdom with us. No, it's great. And anybody who watches this understand that if you're young in the business, get your circle of friends right now and cherish those people because what's it been for us 30 years being 25 30 years about that and uh for all of us and i mean that'll that'll this will last a lifetime you know for me it'll always last a lifetime so i appreciate your guys's friendship uh down the road and you know with everything that you guys have taught me because um it doesn't matter if you've been a head coach assistant it doesn't, you know the things that i've learned from you guys has been um you know, second to none. And, uh, you know, we'll always, you know, hopefully the next final four, where is it San Antonio next year? Um, maybe we'll be out, out and about and sharing some stories amongst other things. <laughs> Guarantee we're going to be out and about to, uh, to, to, to reconvene and continue the conversation. I, I'll wrap it up too. And, uh, and then B, I'm sure we'll jump back in, but I just really want to say, Yvonne, I, my, Ches story is I think it was the first time I was coaching at the University of San Francisco and going to Oregon City and I'm in the lobby uh, of the host hotel and and just start a conversation with you and I think to your point the reason you have been in this so long is that you're not afraid to ask a question of somebody and get help on something else and I, and I think that it if that was the advice that I learned in that moment with you as a young assistant, that was the thing that I, I think that we're all trying to help use this platform to help young coaches, to help other coaches in our profession 
grow and, and be willing to ask for help, ask for something they don't know. And, and I think that has uh, been the joy of, of having a relationship with you for so long is there was never, is never, has never been. Um, I'm, I'm at the mountaintop. It's always, I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to be better. So thank you so much for that and, and instilling that and, uh, and, and having that, that relationship with all of us. And it means a lot to us. And thank you so much for your time uh, being on the show with us today. Yeah, this is a great thing, guys. Thanks for having me.